So um, as promised, I want to talk a little bit about uh, dissolving dichotomous thinking, and I'm going to use uh, uh, Mike Levin's and uh, Sam Kriegman's and Doug Blackiston's and my Xenobots, which you see here. Mike is going to follow me and will tell you a little bit about Xenobots and where they came from. I'm not going to focus so much on Xenobots today, but again, use them as an exemplar to think about dichotomous thinking. Um, this is a <clears throat> soft robotics conference, so just to... Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with my work, I've worked in rigid and soft robotics for a number of years, as you see in the top row and the middle row. And I teamed up with Mike uh, a couple of years ago, and we've been exploring this interesting idea of trying to create living robots, building uh, machines that are made from 100% living tissues. Um, as you'll see in this sort of grab bag of projects that I've been involved with, uh, with my students and colleagues uh, over the years, We've looked at various uh, machines. Uh, that, there's a meta material down there in the bottom right. And in many of these approaches, we've taken what we've been able to find uh, in silico and build in reality. And in all the uh, in silico components of each of these panels, uh, we created a search method. Usually it's a genetic algorithm that is searching over all the, is searching over the space of all possible machines that can be made with the parts that were at hand at that time. So in the rigid robots, it's you know, pieces of plastic uh, and stepper motors. In the case of uh, soft robots these days, it's ho uh, so, um, soft, hollow, deformable voxels. Uh, here's an example of one here. And in the case of soft robots, the components are uh, frog cells. So really trying to explore the morpho space. What, out, what, out, what is out there in terms of possible machines? Um, my focus, my conceptual focus through all of this work has been on uh, embodied intelligence. This is sometimes known as morphological computation, embodied AI. It's got lots of different names at this point. Um, Basically, the idea is, can we task a search method with searching for particular bodies that facilitate embodied intelligence rather than obstruct it? And again, there's different ways of interpreting that. Usually what we mean by that is finding a body that's able to exhibit rich, useful, safe, robust behavior with uh, a relatively simple control policy at the helm. In the case of the Xenobots, there is no obvious neural control policy. There is clearly control going on there, but in some cases we can get away with no brain whatsoever. Um, throughout this process, one of the things that, that I've learned along the way that's been kind of interesting is that a lot of my work and others in AI and robotics explodes this idea of dichotomous thinking. And dichotomous thinking shows up not just in robotics and AI, but it shows up across uh, the sciences. So going back to uh, Descartes at the top of this list, uh, the brain-body distinction, um, Mike is going to do a pretty good job in a few short minutes of exploding the genotype-phenotype distinction, or at least our understanding of what these two uh, components uh, do. Soft robotics um, is blurring the distinction between perception and action. You can have actuators that perceive and sensors that act. Um, breaking the world into perception and action is, again, it, that's a human uh, decision. It's not necessarily, that distinction is not necessarily respected in nature or even in the, the soft robotics we make today. Um, Mike and I and Sam and Doug reported self-replicating uh, xenobots just last year, and this explodes the distinction between von Neumann's or Turing's tape and the machine. Um, you can argue that xenobots are organisms or robots or both or neither, or maybe it's not a useful exercise to argue that there's a distinction at all. Other uh, distinctions here that often um, derail discussions at AI conferences and robotics conferences, that is intelligent, that isn't intelligent, that is conscious, that isn't uh, conscious. Somebody mentioned GPT-3 uh, just a few minutes ago. Tony mentioned GPT-3. There was a, a tweet storm a few weeks ago about whether GPT has even a little bit of consciousness. Um, this particular organism, this particular uh, machine has agency. No, it doesn't. It's just physics. I want to focus on one uh, form of dichotomous thinking um, that I think is also being increasingly blurred, which is the agent environment uh, distinction. So when we first learn about robotics, we're taught the sense, think, act 
uh, loop actions impact the environment or they impact the relationship between the machine or the organism and its environment and that changed relationship leads to new sensation or it leads to new thoughts about new actions and around and we round we go the idea here usually is that the actions are affecting outward from the organism or the machine onto this external environment and there is some repercussion that is coming back from outside um, I've drawn the uh, Asimo humanoid robot here as an empty vessel because although, uh, although robots for a long time have been able to push against their world and observe how their world pushes back, there is very little pushing uh, and sensing sensory repercussions of those actions inside. Um, we've heard a lot about organisms uh, over the last uh, hour or two. Obviously, all organisms have very rich inner uh, lives. There are actions they can take consciously or unconsciously internally that produce sensation, which influences the kind of actions that are taken inside. So one of the interesting um, advances, I would say, that's being made as we move from rigid robots to soft robots to biological robots is we're creating machines that have increasingly rich internal lives. And I think as we move forward, it's interesting to ask, does that in, does it, do those internal adaptations in effect pre-train the organism or pre-train the machine for grappling with external change? For those that follow the machine learning uh, literature, there's a lot of interest these days in pre-training. Again, going back to GPT-3, it's kind of a surprising result that if you pre-train a language model to be able to write down a grammatically correct English sentence. From there, it's actually not a very far step to get it to write down the correct English response to a question written in English. So what I'd like to propose here is possibly organisms and in the future machines might pre-train themselves by grappling with internal change or learning how to grapple with internal change and that sort of exaps them or prepares them for grappling with external change. So this idea of having a rich uh, inner life actually goes back a number of centuries. I don't know if any of us are actually in Edinburgh, but if any of you are and are sit sitting in McEwen Hall at the moment, you're a few hundred feet away from uh, this statue of David Hume. Um, in the 1700s, David Hume uh, introspected. He looked within and he was seeking the, reg cog uh, the res cogitans, the, this unceasing self that Descartes had uh, proposed a hundred years previously? Where was this unchanging kernel, this thing that was self? For Hume, he came to a very different conclusion from Descartes. When he looked inside, he felt that he had failed. He didn't see any kernel of unchanging self. All he saw was this constant flux, this constant flickering of perceptions, emotions, and they were flickering past at a very uh, high rapidity. There was this high frequency uh, skipping from images to memories to emotions to remembrances of words past and so on and so forth. So uh, philosophers for a long, long time have introspected about our rich inner uh, mental lives and neuroscience has shown that that even at seeming rest, humans inside an fMRI machine, their brains are also in constant flux. But as always, it's not just about the brain. Our bodies are in constant flux at all different spatial and temporal scales uh, throughout our lifetimes uh, and beyond. So <clears throat> again, looking at uh, robotics, here's an example of uh, a xenobot uh, created by uh, Doug Blackiston and Sam Kriegman. Doug is looking through the microscope here and is mutilating a xenobot. He's cutting it almost in half. This is crazy in external uh, change that it's never experienced before. And this particular robot exhibits zero shot learning. Uh, over a few hours, it immediately and without any learning or seeming adaptation knows what to do and stitches itself back up again. A lot is known about how, uh, about how organisms do this in terms of wound healing. I just want to point out that whatever this xenobot is doing or what any organism does when it's recovering from a wound or some unexpected internal change triggers obviously complex internal change that supports the recovery process. That's been very difficult in traditional robots. If you have a rigid robot, there is no rich inner mental life. All it can do is act on its external world and sense the repercussions of that action. But with soft robotics, 
With soft robotics, it becomes possible to start to create machines that are able to do complex actions internally. And that is useful in adapting to external surprise, like, for example, this quadruped that's about to have all four of its legs uh, cut off. This robot figures out how to locally change volume, inner vol uh, vo change volume of inner voxels that are not on the outer surface, and in effect, regrow back the missing uh, legs. Here's an example from uh, Rebecca Kramer Botiglio's lab at Yale. They made a physical version uh, of this robot, again, out of these soft, uh, hollow silicone voxels. You'll notice that as they increase and decrease in volume in response to supplied and withdrawn uh, compressed air, that there are external changes. You can see the curvature of this robot changing, but there are also unseen internal changes in pressure that result from this. So this is the beginning of a robot that at least is having an, a richer internal physiological life than, than rigid robots. And as I showed you in simulation, it may be possible to use experiences from internal change to pre-train the robot to grapple with unexpected external change. I want to switch now and talk about a much simpler system, a cellular automata. I think most of us are familiar with cellular automata. Here you're watching uh, the rules of a cellular automata be trained uh, to recover from unexpected external change. You'll notice the cellular automata becomes punctured and then recovers from that puncture wound. We can then take one of these trained cellular automata and expose it in the testing regime to uh, insults it never experienced during training. And in this case, you get cancer, you get uncontrolled uh, growth. So this one has not generalized to deal with this exp uh, experience. However, it is possible under different circumstances to train, to train the cellular automata differently so that again, during training, they're able to recover from une unexpected change. And that makes them robust to unexpected change after training. And so what I'm gonna talk you through in the next few minutes is a, a recent publication um, that's coming out this summer that shows how to train a cellular automata to have a rich inner life and to use that to deal with unexpected external events like injury. Um, we're not going to look at uh, we're not going to look at cellular automata uh, performing homeostasis where they're trying to recover from external insult. We're going to look at a, a, a case where they have to grow and then stop and hold a, a static shape. So this is sort of a, a model of development in cellular automata. OK, um, this is some work by uh, Mord Fincev and Mike, who's here as well. Um, this is a neural cellular automata. So each individual cell in the cellular automata, what it does at the next time step is dictated by a neural network that's controlling the state of that, uh, of that cell. If you create a relatively large neural network and you train the heck out of it, you can get it to homeostat. You can get it to grow and hold a target shape. Um, if you Google the last names here and distill, there's a wonderful web app that you can play around with where you can, uh, you can slice and dice uh, lizards here to your heart's content, and in many cases, it will regrow back. Again, it took a lot of training to do that. Um, some recent work by my PhD student, Caitlin Grasso here. Uh, it, uh, she also trained a neural cellular automata, but she was able to make it robust to, uh, using much less training in the following way. During training, uh, whenever a rare action occurred, so in this case here, I'm gonna visualize actions as uh, with, this, with the amount of red. Each individual cell in the cellular automata has a signaling molecule. You can think of this as a red signaling molecule. The darker red the cell is, the more signaling molecule it has. Actions here are defined as an internal change in internal signal. So in this case, this cell is taking an action which increases its local amount of this signaling molecule. If a particular action occurs at time t1 and at some future state, uh, at some future time t2, there is a corresponding rare state. So we're gonna define state here as the amount of signaling molecule in other cells. So here I'm just showing this in blue. It's still the same red signaling molecule, but we're assuming that this central cell here has taken a rare action. 
And uh, that has corresponded somehow with a rare state sometime later. If again, at some other time, that same cell takes the same action, and again, at a same uh, amount of time in the future, that same rare state shows up again, that is sort of indirect evidence that the action taken by the central cell through perhaps many indirect sensor motor, uh, sen sensory action uh, loops causes this rare state in the cellular automata. You can actually measure this from an information theoretic point of view using an information theoretic metric known as empowerment. This was introduced in 2005. And I've just sort of walked you through the intuition behind empowerment. A system is empowered if it can take rare actions and cause rare states in other people, other things that are uh, ca cause, sen cause things to happen um, distant in time, far in the future, distant in space, far from you, and distant in modality. I do something with vibration that causes a change in heat, or I send out a verbal call and that causes a change in the visual input to another agent in my environment at a future time. That's empowerment. I'm empowered if I can cause rare events in others or other things far from me in space or time. You can take empowerment and turn it into a fitness function inside a genetic algorithm. In this case, what I'm going to show you is a multi-objective optimization method. This is a, a bi-objective optimization method. We have two objectives. We're going to try and optimize uh, cellular automata so that those cellular automata are accurate, meaning if we give the cellular automata a target shape, that cellular automata will grow or it will turn cells on to exactly fill that shape and then fill no further, become stable. So that's accuracy on the vertical axis here. At the same time, we're gonna to look to see whether this cellular automata is empowered. If we look across all cells at every point in time, do they perform rare actions that reliably cause rare events in the same cellular automata later in time? What that leads to is <clears throat> if you visualize here the cellular automata as a, uh, if you visualize, sorry, this evolving population, you can imagine we have three different cellular automata. Um, at generation zero, maybe one of them is kind of accurate, but not very empowered. The other one is kind of empowered, but not very accurate. Another one is really not very good at, at either. If we continue running this bi-objective optimization method, we get this Pareto front moving up and to the right, meaning in general, all of the cellular automata in the population are getting better and better at homeostatting, growing and then holding a target shape, and they are doing so by becoming increasingly empowered. Here's some results of this process. So on the horizontal axis here, we have evolutionary time in our population of evolving cellular automata. Um, the plots here are for er error and empowerment. So low error is better here. The lower curves are better. As you can see here, the green curve uh, does the best. It produces the most accurate or the lowest error cellular automata, those best able to grow rapidly and then hold a target shape. If we select for them to be to have low error and to have high empowerment. We compared this against two different control studies, and I won't go into the details, but basically in these two controls, we only selected for error. We only exerted selection pressure in the genetic algorithm to favor those that homeostat. And somewhat counterintuitively, if we select for those that have low error and are empowered, at the end, we get better homeostatting cellular automata. In the third control, we evolved uh, cellular automata to just be empowered and not necessarily heart hold the target shape. And you'll see in the purple curve here, even though there was no direct selection pressure whatsoever for growing and then becoming stable, you get it for free a little bit if you evolve empowered cellular automata. We can take the same data from these four different genetic algorithms and plot instead not how error decreases over time, but how empowerment increases over time. The purple curve, obviously, if we directly select for empowerment, empowerment goes up. But if we look in particular at the blue and orange curves, 
where we are only selecting for error, we are only selecting for their ability to homeostat, empowerment is also increasing. Each cell in the cellular automata is getting better at indirectly influencing the state of other cells that are far from them in the cellular automata and that produce that desired state far from them in the future of the cellular automata uh, evolution. Okay, I think uh, I have one minute left, which will give me just time to thank uh, Caitlin Grasso, who did all the work on empowered neural cellular automata here, uh, Sam Kriegman, who did a lot of the computational work on xenobots, and uh, Mike and Doug, who did all the actual work on the physical uh, xenobots. I will stop there and happy to take any questions. Thanks very much.